Good evening, everybody. My name is Travis Wodurski. Thank you for joining this edition of Miller Shop Talk Live, being the aluminum series. Tonight, we're going to talk about a little bit of material prep for aluminum. I'm joined with Andrew Fowler. We've also got James on the line. James is going to be your voice to Andrew and I. So as much as we can tonight, we want to answer your questions live. We've got a couple of them that came in in our opening segment last week that we'll get to as well. Um, so to go ahead and get started, Andrew, you want to give everybody who might just be joining us for the first time a little brief introduction of who you are, what you do, and kind of what we're going to be doing. Sure. Thanks, Travis. So my name is Andrew Fowler. I'm a segment manager with our TIG division at uh, Miller Electric here in Appleton, Wisconsin. And uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight is uh, the proper preparation prior to welding uh, in order to make sure that you guys out there are successful in uh, welding on aluminum in various different applications. So we have a couple of different topics that we're going to cover tonight, and we'll uh, go ahead and get started on that. Yep, and we're going to try to cover, obviously, the very basics of aluminum metal prep. We're also going to talk about some of, especially what Andrew's seen through some of the more of the advanced TIG applications and things like that um, through years of very pertinent information for those even who are in, you know, the more manufacturing side of things or high production kind of environment. So we'll try to cover some content that's across the board, um, not just for the very beginner or the very advanced and kind of mix it up. Again, like I said, we've got a direct connection to you guys through the chat. So if you've got questions you'd like answered tonight, please feel free to put those in the chat. James will relay those to us. If you've got questions that are a little bit more complicated, uh, we've got the shop talk live at millerwelds.com. You can email us those questions. We'll either try to answer them on the next um, shop talk live, or if it's a very detailed question, we might send you some resources through your email that way as well. But at the end goal, trying to help you with, you know, your problems that you're seeing with aluminum one way or the other. So we appreciate you joining us tonight. We're going to be doing more of these seminars, like I said, building starting tonight with aluminum prep. Our next seminar is going to be 223, and we're going to be covering some GMAW basics. And then, again, progressing from there through different TIG processes, some advanced mag, and, and going from there. So if you guys have other topics that you want to see, other problems that you're having, make sure you email those to us. And those might end up being in a future episode or a, you know, the basics, basis for a future episode as well. So, again, my name is Travis Widerski. I'm a welding engineer with Miller. I've been here going on about 12 years now. I know Andrew's got a similar background to what I do, and we spend a lot of time with customers. So, again, it, it, our real focus here is to answer your questions technically on aluminum. So feel free to ask us what you have. Um, and, again, if it's not something on prep, Specifically, we'll try to cover that in a future event as well. So to go ahead and get started, I think w one of the main things that obviously makes aluminum aluminum and gives it a lot of the properties that we like to see, the corrosion resistance, that kind of thing, is the oxide layer that's on top of it. The problem with this oxide layer is it melts at about 3,600 degrees. Uh, if you've ever done a weld where the backside of it kind of looks like bubble gum and you know, it, it just kind of didn't quite fall through. That aluminum oxide both has that higher melting temperature and it's extremely strong for how thin it is. Um, so a lot of times that oxide layer is all that kept that aluminum from really falling out the bottom, as long as your plate wasn't on the table, something like that. But we really combat that 3,600 melting degree temperature versus pure aluminum is going to be 1228. Your different alloys are going to be somewhere in between. Uh, so, Andrew, you want to talk a little bit about how are some of the basic steps that we're going to get rid of the oxide and what do we need to do and what what are challenges do you see from this? Sure. Yeah, and, and so, as Travis mentioned, the, the melting temperature is, is certainly a, a, a piece that we have to contend with. If we think about the aluminum oxide itself, um, it's actually considered a ceramic uh, in a sense in the fact that it's extremely hard. If you think about a lot of the abrasives and things that are used in grind, you know, grinding discs, the flap discs, the grinding wheels, a lot of those are actually made out of aluminum oxide. So we, we know that it's an extremely hard material. And uh, when we're trying to weld on it, if that oxide is thick enough, it can actually be you know, not as conductive as the base material, uh, the base you know, material in the middle of the, the component. So that, that certainly brings its own characteristics when we're trying to arc weld. The other thing that we have to contend with is the fact that aluminum, 
the uh, pure, you know, pure alloy aluminum in the in the middle of the component. When we melt that, and and both the um, the pure aluminum and the oxides on the surface, if we can get it to the point of being melted, anything that's trapped in that that oxide layer. So the oxide layer is extremely porous. The way I would describe it, it's like a sponge. So anything that's on the surface of it, even though you can't see it, it is uh, it is a porous structure. And so any oil or uh, hydrocarbons that might be on the surface actually go and get melted into solution. And so if you look at a, a solubility chart of hydrogen, so hydrocarbons, one of the base uh, elements in there is hydrogen. And those, uh, those hydrogen molecules or elements uh, go into solution or get dissolved, much like sugar into like a Kool-Aid or iced tea if you're, if you're making that. And so the hotter the aluminum gets or the more uh, beyond the molten state, the higher the solubility of hydrogen. And, and that's something that's unique to aluminum and can actually cause a lot of problems. So a lot of people have the, the conception of, well, I'm just going to go ahead and as soon as it gets molten, we're boiling those, that moisture, those hydrocarbons off of that material. And that's actually not necessarily true. We're actually, actually it's like heating liquid in order to make jello. It, the, the warmer you get that liquid, the more it can actually dissolve. And that creates a unique situation for us because when that material cools back down from being molten, it actually starts saying, hey, I can't have all of this hydrogen in solution. And it starts trying to kick it out. Um, and as, as that molten aluminum starts to solidify and come back into a solid state. And so what ends up happening is those uh, hydrogen molecules actually start uh, collecting and forming bubbles. And those bubbles eventually, if they can't escape to the surface, um, get entrapped in the weld as porosity. And so by and large, the number one source, or really the, the source of porosity in aluminum is, uh, is you know, commonly attributed to hydrocarbons. So whether that's hydrogen from, uh, you know, that's possibly in a, uh, in the shielding gas, if it's not a, you know, low dew point shielding gas, it could be hydrocarbons that are left in the aluminum oxides on the base material, or it could be, uh, you know, contamination caused by, uh, you know, uh, a void or a break in our shielding gas lines. If we're using a, a, a process that has, you know, like MIG or TIG, um, you know, there's a, a various different uh, places that that can be introduced along with not just the base material, but also the filler material if we're using, you know, a wire, um, either TIG or MIG. Yeah, and a lot of these hydrocarbons too can even be coming from, you know, surface prep or oils, greases, that kind of thing that are left on the surface. We'll talk about here in a little bit as well. Um, but again, so the, kind of the general point here is that oxide layer does a lot of good things for us. You know, if we look at stuff that oxide layer, again, is really what drives a lot of aluminum's characteristics that we're looking for. Uh, it's very, very thin but we need to get rid of it to weld. As soon as the part is welded, or even if you wire brush it and let it sit out in the open, that is going to start regrowing itself immediately. Um, so, you know, even a part that you wire brushed yesterday, best case scenario, we're going to want to clean that again before you start welding because that oxide layer is always trying to grow itself. Um, so, again, like Andrew said, we've got a lot of issues that it can create as well, whether that's just the oxide layer itself floating on the surface. You can imagine if you melt something that's 1300 degrees, the 3600 is just floating on the top. So a lot of times you go to add your filler, you're just kind of pushing it around. That's going to create some problems. Like Andrew said, if you do get it liquid, then you can start creating some of these porosity issues. Some of these also come from storage, can make this oxide layer worse. So if anybody's ever, you know, read on aluminum, they're typically going to tell you to take your plate, stand them up if you can, make sure you've got, you know, proper venting and storage where water's not getting trapped in there. If you look at this, this is a picture of the surface. If you've ever seen, you know, the top of a piece of aluminum plate or something like that that looks like it's got a white powdery residue on there, that's actually hydrated aluminum oxide. So that's basically where water sat and collected and made that oxide layer worse. You try to weld over that, you're going to have some pretty poor results um, because that oxide layer is so much worse in those areas. 
So proper storage of your aluminum is going to be key. Um, so Andrew, what are a couple tips that you have for how we should be storing our material in the shop, out of the shop? Should we be bringing it in before we weld it? Yeah. So it's, um, as Travis said, you know, standing any plates up, um, you know, with appropriate protection, keep from tipping over, of course, but um, making sure that there's not places for that, uh, that the pool. One of the big things with aluminum, because it is, does have such a high thermal conductivity, um, it, you know, if you bring a piece of material in from outside, so for example, up here, the northern climates, uh, here in Wisconsin, right now it's below freezing outside. If we bring that piece of material inside into a shop environment where it's maybe, you know, hot moist air or warm moist air and there's a, a threshold cross of the dew point of the air in the environment that we're bringing it into we can actually cause condensation onto the uh, that base material that we're going to weld on a lot of the codes and specifications actually require um, you know the, the material be brought up to temperature uh, typically up to ambient temperature you know 68 70 degrees if it is below 32 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So we do have uh, a lot of the codes and specs that give some guidance around that. But and that's because of that best practice. We want to make sure that when we start welding on it or before we start welding on it, we don't have condensation on those components. Yeah, so it's extremely important. Um, again, if if you and this is going to be some of the general basics that are going to hold true, whether you're TIG welding, whether you're MIG welding, if you're oxy fuel welding aluminum, best of luck to you, but it's <laughs> the the better off you're going to be there as well. Um, and we'll talk about all those processes well uh, outside of oxy fuel a little bit. We'll touch on it maybe in the TIG side, but um, these are going to be pertinent steps to all of your different processes that are going to help you out. From my perspective, it's it's kind of like you know going back to steel where everybody went to a sixty ten type of rod because it could burn through grease with it. Uh, you might get a little bit better result, but from, you know, the engineer in me, it's hard to kick it off of. If it's there beforehand, it's there after, it's just where did it go? So if we can get rid of that oxide layer before we start welding on it, we're going to set ourselves up to be a lot more successful right from the beginning versus trying to fight it all the way through. And there's some pretty easy ways to get rid of your oxide layer on most materials. You know, if it's something that's anodized, truly all they're doing is growing that oxide layer even thicker. Um, so those can be a little bit more difficult, but for most of your general plate, you know, all that kind of stuff, it, it's going to be fairly easy to get rid of the oxide layer. There's a few different ways that we can do it. Uh, but again, it's very important that you do clean it. Um, and one thing to keep in mind as you start cleaning, we're going to talk about chemical cleaning and mechanical cleaning. You know, stainless steel wire brush is going to be probably the most common way that anybody cleans aluminum. But if you take a look at aluminum under a microscope, it looks like a bunch of fingers. So it loves to grab contamination. So if I've got dirt, grease, like Andrew said, any kind of hydrocarbon, so any kind of oil-based product that's on the surface or left over from, we'll talk a little bit about cutting and different kind of prep there, what might be left from a, a coolant or different kind of fluid like that that was on the material, aluminum loves to grab that stuff. And if you don't get rid of those greases before you start brushing, a lot of times you can actually drive those deeper into the surface. So if you've got something that's extremely dirty, greasy, you know, it's been in an engine bay or around oil, whatever that might be, you're going to want to chemically clean it first, then mechanical, and then potentially chemical again. Um, so if we look at chemical cleaning, Andrew, what would be your first steps and what are some of the kind of... Uh, common solvents that you see out there used for cleaning aluminum yeah so in regards to well so some of the ones that i've seen i guess i'll i'll start with uh our recommendation kind of do a big loop back around but uh, our recommendation is the lps zero try so this is an aerosolized um uh, solvent based cleaner uh one of the big notables here is use non-chlorinated cleaners uh, or solvents um, with if you try to use a lot of brake cleaners and things like that, they you know some of them do have chlorine in them, and when exposed to UV light, that uh, which is essential welding arc, uh, that can you know create a uh, potentially hazardous environment. So we would like to try to avoid that, um, and so that's why we we recommend something like the LPS, which is you know one of the one of the better options out in the industry. 
I have seen in the past where uh, I've, I've gone into different customer sites or different uh, you know places where they're doing aluminum welding and they take a component straight out of a machining operation, a turning operation or a milling operation, and they send it down to the weld cell. And what ultimately happens is that it's the responsibility of the person doing the welding to make sure that all of the material prop is done properly in order to do to get the best results. And as Travis mentioned, um, the aluminum has you know that finger-like structure in the oxide to grab all that that contamination. So just taking a, a rag and wiping it off this you know wiping off the surface is is yes it's going to get the bulk of it, but there's still a lot of um, you know crevices uh you know small microscopic areas where that that uh fluid or hydrocarbon can be can be trapped and using a, a solvent like lps is going to help you know bring that you know, kind of float that stuff up to the surface and allow you to wipe that away um, and then kind of looking at the next step behind that is we go we go to wire brushing um some of the, the materials that we don't want to be using, I've seen people use things like window cleaner uh, to try to wipe away the solvent. And really that's not, it's a water-based solution and it's not going to you know, dissolve and, and help bring that material adequately up to the surface and or it's going to be depositing its own residue, which is then have, you know, going to end up ultimately into the welding when we try to you know, strike an arc on it. Yeah, so you're taking you're adding in more moisture and a lot of times those chlorine aside a lot of times those have ammonia in them so another chemical you don't want to be burning and breathing so there's there's a lot of different ones out there um you know one of the probably the most common ones that i see on the road is acetone which you have to be careful with because it's also a hydrocarbon based so you you want to make sure anything that you clean with that is dry um and completely broken down anything you're trying to get off the from the surface so any grease anything like that you need to make sure is completely gone before you try to weld on that because you might be making a worse denatured alcohol i know is another one we see quite a bit but like say if you go to your weld shop your distributor they're going to have a lot of the products like this zero try that are going to be in use for welding all the time specifically for that to try to not create more issues for you than what you had to start with yeah and, and i think kind of to in parallel with the the solvent that we're going to use another main factor typically you're not just going to be using a solvent you're going to be using some sort of a rag or a wipe to to you know wipe the material off or clean the material off and that's another factor to consider um, you use a clean, dry, lint-free rag um, in conjunction with the solvent that you're going to be using. Um, I've, I've seen or experienced in the past different places that are trying to use, um, a lot of times you'll see like the red shop rags, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, maintenance shops and things like that will have a, an abundance of those red rags that get sent off to a company to get laundered and brought back for reuse. Um, ultimately what that can cause is that uh, those laundries or those services that provide that, they are not, I mean, you get those things back and they're stained and discolored. And that means there's still something, ultimately a little bit of residue still left in there, along with whatever, uh, you know, whatever detergent they used uh, in the laundry process to clean that could be getting deposited then onto your uh, onto your base material prior to welding because in, in in essence you could say sometimes depending on how clean it is the solvent could be washing <laughs> that detergent and that you know grease or or oil residue whatever might be left in that rag washing it out of that rag onto your part versus the what we're intending to do is actually pull any contamination off of our base aluminum yeah, and, and that's a good point too. Even with getting into like the microfiber towels and stuff like that too, a lot of times those chemicals that you're might be using as a degreaser might also break down some of those towels that are not cotton based or something like that, where you might actually be somewhat melting them and dragging some residue into that surface as well. So, like Andrew said, those clean, typically the white cotton 
is going to be the best. Even the blue shop towels that you get in the rolls, a lot of times those, if you wipe them across the windshield of your car, you're going to see a lot of times they leave a streak from a different, you know, compound that's inside of those as well. Um, James, I know we've had a couple comments come in so far. Yeah. You want to shoot a couple of those that yeah, we've, we've got, got a in for questions users tonight? Here. One of them um, that I'm seeing quite a bit here is, uh, what about using like a rubbing alcohol, like a 99% isopropyl alcohol to, to clean my aluminum? What, what we've seen it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. One, one issue with using uh, an alcohol-based cleaner is that alcohol is actually going to attract moisture. Um, so it, it can actually pull moisture essentially out of the atmosphere um, and, and actually deposit that onto the material. So generally we would not, you can, I guess it's all depends on how dirty your part is and what you have available. It could be better than not using an alcohol if you have extreme amounts of grease or something along those lines. Um, but in the best practice, I mean, if we're if we're looking at an aerospace application, something like that, that's not going to be the preferred preferred method. You know, we're going to have relatively clean base material. You're trying to ultimately get the get the cards stacked in the, in your favor in that deck, and so we're going to. There's better options out there if they're available. Now, if you're on a farm and you got absolutely no other option and you're trying to you know weld on a part that's been in service that's extremely greasy or dirty certainly alcohol might be better than not getting the grease off of there it's going to act a little bit as a um, solvent detergent to help remove that dirt or grease but if we have an alternative like a zero try or or even an acetone that's going to be a little bit better than than using an alcohol based compound yeah, and that's what I was going to say. You might be trading one thing for another with the moisture aspect of it, too. James, um, what else do we have? We've got a question here about um, can the oxide layer ever actually be removed mechanically in an oxygenated environment? Or because it, it seems like um, the oxide layer forms instantly. So, how do we kind of get around that? So it depends on what kind of environment you're in. Obviously, some are better than others. That oxide layer is going to begin regrowth as soon as you clean it. Um, but depending on what level of quality you need to get to, you know, if I wire brush it and I'm going to weld it immediately, 99.9% .9 of general fab situations, that's going to be just fine. Uh, you put it in an oxygen-rich environment, it's actually probably going to start growing faster than what it would be a normal atmosphere because that's again it's gonna be aluminum oxide it's it's realistically rust what you would see in a vehicle on steel is somewhat comparable to what the oxide layer is going to be here um if you're in a super clean environment andrew any tips for them there that you've seen in the aerospace kind of area so as far as like preventing it from from regrowing like Travis said, there's not really a way that we can prevent it for unless you are in a completely inert atmosphere. Of course. Um, a lot of times in, for example, in the aerospace industry, what happens is the parts come on a cart or, you know, are delivered to the welding cell or brought to the welding cell. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the welder doing the, the actual final welding is also doing their material prep. Uh, it's not maybe like, like what you'd see on the steel and like the pipeline industry where a helper is doing it for them, they are typically doing it themselves. And ultimately, they're going to do uh, a chemical cleaning with a solvent to remove any, you know, even oils from your fingers, uh, things like that, that that could be on the component as well as on the filler material. They're going to go through, do a wire brushing process, and generally they will do another wipe with a second rag or uh, uh so like a, they would a lot of times use like a cotton rag with a with a solvent pumper and and wipe down a second time after they do the wire brushing with the stainless steel wire brush, and they would do that immediately prior once they verify that the part has no you know residue left on it um, you know everything's evaporated off of it anything maybe from the solvent that is left there would be evaporated off of it they'll remove those cleaning materials from the welding area and then immediately go to and commence welding. 
And so a couple other good things that you so, co covered right there, um, real quick before we get into the next one was your filler material, whether it's going to be the chemical or mechanical that we're going to talk about a little bit, you need to be cleaning that as well. It's got the oxide layer on it, just like your base material does. Andrew also just mentioned oil from your fingers. You know, if, if you're not wearing gloves, a lot of times if you're used to TIG welding all the time and you hit that spot where your fingers were sitting for a while, you'll see that art flare. Um, so that's why we're typically wearing cotton gloves in those environments as well. Because even, you know, if you're wearing gloves that were you were using on steel or in an oily environment, if it's a mechanic shop, something like that, you can be driving that contamination from your filling material, not just from the base plate. Um, so you got to be careful with making sure everything that you're putting into that weld is clean as well, not just the base material. And we'll talk about your edge prep a little bit too, but if you're thinking about a plate, it's not just the top of the plate if you're on a weld joint. It's going to be every side that might, you know, get up to temp within that weld zone. So it's, you know, the top of the plate, the side of the plate, the bottom, whatever that joint looks like, you want to make sure you're cleaning all sides of that surface as well. Yeah, and, and generally, generally what we're going to be doing is we're going to be cleaning not just right where, as Travis mentioned, not right where the weld is, but we're also going to be cleaning back an inch or two from that at least, um, depending on the amount of, you know, the condition of the material and how large the part is. If we think about oil, uh, for example, um, or, or wax, uh, like a saw wax, the Travis mentioned material prop, which we'll cover here in a little bit. But if, if you think about oils or wax, as they get hot, they tend to flow or wick along the surface because of the, the nature of that material or that compound. And so even if you, you know, clean an inch back, as that piece heats up, um, you'll actually get, I don't know if this is the proper term, but a capillary action of that, that, uh, that oil in the surrounding weld zone could actually get kind of sucked or flow across the surface of the material and end up in our molten weld pool. Uh, and, and cause either issues from it getting in the actual molten welding pool or get extremely close and then essentially, you know, boil or vaporize and cause issues with our shielding gas stream if it's a MIG or a TIG welding process. Thanks. Any, anything yeah, else that we've got in, James? Specifically around cleaners. Uh, what about acid-based cleaners? And how about Alumabrite aluminum cleaner? So I, I have had um, some of the different aerospace companies. I don't know the exact compound that they were using. It's been several years, but I have heard of companies using some sort of an acid bath uh, to remove you know, oxides from the material. Uh, generally, from, from what I've seen is that when they are doing some sort of an acid bath, they are then um, essentially rinsing or washing the parts in a... Uh, in a water bath and then you know bringing the components out and drying them so it really depends on the results that you're looking for obviously any process has to be tested they they were doing some experimental things with their process um, trying to resolve some some quality issues uh, in in order to meet some end quality requirements for the aerospace industry and and ultimately a little bit of a trade-off you know there could be you know machining fluids on that. There could be heavy oxides from the way that the materials are stored after it came out of, uh, you know, a machining operation. And, and, and they felt that using that acid bath was, you know, and then essentially washing it in a, uh, in a water bath was going to help reduce the amount of hydrocarbons or oxides on the surface. They were still doing some of the mechanical cleaning things after the water bath still in order to um, in order to help ensure that the wells were successful. So there's always a, a trade off of, of cost and risk that has to be be weighed out in the you know preparation sequence. And for most companies, um, you know, the, the cost of bringing in some sort of an acid and all of the uh, you know safety protocols that come into play with that and then you know, washing it in a water solution, disposal of any of those materials, certainly is usually outside of the scope for your average company. And so therefore, some of the stuff that we're going to be going through today is a little bit more basic and will, you know, can still provide very good results um, if done properly.
And that's not to say that some of those assets won't work. You, you definitely just want to be careful, though, too, like Andrew said, from the safety side of things. If you're looking at an asset, you know, what it, what is the welding you know, recommendation for that from the manufacturer? It doesn't need to be neutralized before you weld on it, anything like that. So any of those assets, you're definitely going to want to make sure you know from the manufacturer what their recommendation, what their procedure is to use it. Because um, they're definitely out there to strip that oxide layer off. You know, a lot of trailers use it. You know, so some of those shops that might do the Aluma Bright kind of cleaning yeah that sounds like it might work really well um and maybe it will you just want to make sure that you're going down the right steps where you're not putting yourself in danger by using one of those as well so as we move on from the chemical side of things like we say the next one's going to be mechanical once we mechanically clean we might go back and chemical clean again with the same process that we just talked about uh, but by far i would say the most common thing that i've ever seen Cleaning aluminum mechanically is going to be a stainless steel wire brush. One of the questions we had got from our opening seminar is what kind of brush can we use? Can it be steel? Um, can it be stainless? It needs to be a stainless steel wire brush. So again, like we talked earlier, that surface really looks like a bunch of fingers. So if you take a steel brush, it wants to grab and strip actually some of the chemicals out of those steel bristles. Uh, if anybody's ever used a regular steel wire brush on aluminum and then tried to weld over it and you see a little orange, you know, flare around the weld or even on the surface, a lot of times you're actually burning out that iron um, and different chemicals that were in that brush. Same thing if I take my stainless steel wire brush that I'm supposed to have dedicated to aluminum, use it on some steel plate, come back, brush it on the aluminum. A lot of times you're going to see that same contamination transfer. Um, Andrew, you've got a couple different brushes there obviously diff different size but you want to talk a little bit about what you see and what you do for mechanical cleaning as well yeah so um as as travis mentioned uh, when we look at the mechanical cleaning um with that carbon steel brush as he mentioned leaving behind some of the you know some iron component that you'll see show up a lot of times after you weld on it um, another factor to consider too is a lot of times a carbon steel brush what do they do at the store or at the supplier to keep it from rusting prior to it getting to you? They're going to spray some sort of an oil on it, right? And we just got done talking about trying to stack the cards in the deck to give us the best results. And so you may have degreased it and now you're brushing it with a carbon steel brush that's got oil on it. You could be driving, uh, you know, that, that oil essentially into the material when we're trying to remove it and, and give ourselves the best results. So, um, as, as Travis mentioned, the stainless steel wire brush is going to be the best option here. Uh, we, you know, they come in various different sizes, small ones, big ones. It really depends on what you're doing. Probably one of the things that I could say is the worst thing that, that you can do is, and I see it quite commonly, is people using, um, you know, some sort of a, like a, like a four inch angle grinder and putting a knotted, you know, knotted, uh, a, a knotted bristle brush, whether it's stainless steel or even carbon steel, um, onto that that grinder and expecting to get good results. So generally, we recommend a a a you know low pressure solution like a handheld wire brush um, in order to get the best results. Ultimately, what happens is if you are using a high speed, um, like an angle grinder, for example, that can actually drive and it, instead of removing the material and and cutting those oxides off of the surface they end up smearing or galling the the surface of the material and and basically driving those oxides into the substrate or into the subsurface layer versus removing them and and that's obviously not going to be getting us the results that we're looking for so um stainless steel wire brush uh as travis mentioned using the straight strokes and you can see here um, a lot of times you think that, hey, I've got a nice piece of, you know, clean, clean coupon here. Um, and this is this is a piece that we, uh, you know, brushed half of it earlier. And you can see the the drastic difference. This was probably about, you know, two, three hours ago that we, we brushed this. And just that difference, uh, the right side versus the left side. And you can see the the amount of, you know, oxides that were on even a brand new piece of aluminum. And if you were to try to weld on the the left side of this uh, coupon versus the side that we wire, you know, brushed with our stainless steel wire brush, 
um, we'd, we'd probably have a different result. So just a little bit of preparation using the proper methods uh, certainly can go a, a, a long way. Some of the other tools that we want to talk about, um, I mentioned not using you know, something like an angle grinder. Um, what we do see is uh, quite often, and this is, this is generally considered an acceptable practice, is uh, if you have you know, a little bit, something a little bit heavier, or it's maybe not a, an easy shape to get at with a wire brush, maybe like an inside corner, something like that, you can use uh, a carbide burr. These work quite well. Um, one of the things to consider with these is a lot of times when you're using pneumatic tools, uh, being mindful of where the exhaust on that tool is venting. Uh, some of them vent out the front, uh, like right here, you can see this one uh, likely exhausts out the front versus out the rear of the tool. So having a rear exhaust uh, is, e even though the front exhaust may, you know, may be blowing chips away for you, things like that, having the rear exhaust is gonna be better uh, a better solution simply because of the fact that most air tools, you know, if, if you actually follow and look at the manufacturer's <laughs> recommendations for them, they're going to say, you know, oil daily. Or if your system has an automatic oil on it, is going to, um, you know, be putting oil into that, that stream of air coming out. Also, with the stream of air coming out, as the, that uh, you know, compressed air comes out of the tool, it is actually, you know, uh, could be bringing condensation from the line. Uh, you know, a lot of people, the recommendation is that you drain your, uh, you know, your air compressor tank out on a regular basis. If you've ever done that, you know that there's a lot of water condensation collects in there. And that's really coming from the temp temperature and pressure differences within the, uh, the air compressor and that can get sprayed or deposited onto the surface of the material. Yeah, and another thing to keep in mind, like Andrew said, if we go back to the grinder and high speed on the brush is going to smear into the surface typically you know a lot of grinders out there now they're using flap wheels which are by and large made out of aluminum oxide or <laughs> some other kind of oxide like that that we're going to end up driving into the surface of that plate uh, andrew's got another one there in front of him that we see a lot in the aluminum side which is going to be something with like a scotch bright type of pad on there whether that's on a grinder or even by hand you're wiping that a lot of times on filler material, trying to get the oxide layer off the filler material. But you have to be careful with those two because those are going to be a product that's a hydrocarbon base. So not only can they start smearing the surface and plugging up or trying to use a uh, some kind of oil or something like that to keep them from clogging up, that's going to, again, create you more issues than it is helping. Um, so those can work. Most of the time, if you're using those, you're going to have to chemically clean after them to get the best results you can, but they're going to be something that you have to be pretty careful with. Is that what you're seeing typically in industry too, Andrew? Yeah, so so generally the where, where we see the most success is it starts with a uh, a wire brush. If used, it would be, you know, the, the carbide burr or, you know, some sort of a, a cutting tool, uh, what you consider a cutting tool versus a grinding tool. So the carbide burr, you know, style tools and then um, doing it as you mentioned Travis that uh, that chemical cleaning after uh, doing the mechanical style cleaning perfect James I know we've had a couple um, questions coming in on mechanical cleaning before we move yeah, we've on got here a couple of them um, do we need to brush in only one direction I would say the direction isn't as much quite the concern as it is the force. Like Andrew said, you want to make sure you're using enough pressure that you're actually getting material off from the surface. Um, you know, as much as you can go in one direction, it's going to help if you're, you know, getting away from your weld and you're pushing that contamination away where you're not dry, pushing it one way and immediately bringing that same powder that you just brushed off the surface and driving it back in. Um, so part of that will depend on your technique. But again, you want to make sure you've got enough surface pressure there, too. You'll notice when that material starts to grab the brush a little bit more. Like Andrew said, it's extremely uh, hard material. It's considered a ceramic. So when you first start trying to brush it, that brush is really going to skate across the surface. Once it really starts to grab, you're going to feel that. You want to make sure you're getting that oxide removed. But as long as you're brushing 
you know, to where you're clearing that material one direction before you're going the other way and you're not directly going over the exact same spot back and forth, back and forth, then you're truly going to start driving that contamination deeper into the material. Um, so, you know, best case, probably think of it as pushing it in one direction as long as you're not overlapping and driving into that same spot over and over again. Another question we've got here, you can't brush filler wire. So what do you do? Uh, stainless wool, Scotch Brite. How do you how do you clean the filler metal? Yeah. So, yeah. So that's that's a good point. Um, Travis had mentioned that a lot of people you will use some sort of a you know an abrasive pad, um, and typically uh, those are of a hydrocarbon based compound. Uh, you know they have some sort of a a bonding agent that's holding that that abrasive together. And ultimately, what we want to be careful of is depositing that behind. If if you have it available, really the thing that you can use is a stainless steel steel wool. Um, it's it's not the most readily available thing that you can find. You know, most hardware stores will have steel wool, but finding a stainless steel version of that can sometimes be a little bit more difficult. Um, a lot of times, the filler material, if it's being stored properly in a not temperature, you know. In, in not a location where the temperature is varying greatly, um, you're probably not going to have a, a heavy amount of oxide on the surface of it, uh, but it is good to try to remove that if possible. So again, same same methodology as our base material. Use a, a, a chemical wipe, use the uh, you know abrasive, whether that be an abrasive pad or stainless steel steel wool, and then again, follow it up with that that uh, that solvent wipe. To make sure that we're removing any of that dust and contamination that we just, you know, uh, essentially scraped off of the surface, to prior to actually beginning our welding process. And one place you'll see a lot of contamination on your filling material is if you're in a situation, you know, maybe you got a race car haul or something like that, where you're going down the road and your filling material is not stored real tightly, and you know, we saw it a lot with the trucks on the road where you pull a piece of filler out of the tube and it's all black. You got that fretting corrosion on there. You want to make sure you get rid of it in that scenario. Like Andrew said, you pull it off the box, off the shelf. Typically, you know, most of the time for general fab, just wiping it down is going to be fine. The smaller brush that Andrew's got there, I've actually used those quite a bit. Um, kind of two of those brushes pushed together and ran the filler material through it because they're pretty fine bristled. Uh, but yeah, definitely something you want to take note of there. Steel wool, like Andrew said, if you can get it, it's going to be your best option. Um, if we look past the mechanical, so really bad scenarios, we're going to chemical clean it, then we're going to mechanical, we're going to chemical clean it again, typically is the best practice after we've brushed it um, to get rid of any of that oxide that's, you know, powder form kind of that we've broken loose from the surface, make sure it's all wiped away and clean. You guys will notice we spent the bulk of our time tonight talking about cleaning aluminum. Um, and we're going to spend a little bit more time here talking about edge prep and joint geometry in the few minutes that we have left. But the reason why we spend so much time talking about cleaning aluminum, you know, from my perspective, is the number one thing that makes a huge difference in setting you up for success, whether you're a beginner or whether you're in a fab shop and you need high quality. Aluminum is extremely picky to contamination. You know, you're going to see that in your welds and travel direction when we get into MIG welding and stuff like that. And, you know, it's surface contamination. All of that plays a huge role in how successful you're going to be in your end result. Um, so that's why we spend so much time here today talking about cleaning it, because it is that important. As we move on into a little bit more of the joint prep, we're going to talk about a couple things in, in cutting the material and what kind of different processes produce a weldable or non-weldable edge. And then we'll talk a little bit about your base metal filler metal um, comparison and selection and some joint geometries that make a difference here in our la last few 15 minutes that we've got here. Again, if you've got questions tonight, feel free to ask them in the chat. If you've got something that's a little bit more specific or a topic you want to talk about in one of our future events, please send those into the shop talk live at MillerWelds.com email um, or at MillerWelds will work as well and just mention the aluminum shop talk live series. So Andrew, you want to talk a little bit about if we cut our material one way or the other, whether that's going to be a shear, plasma, saw, what are some of the things that we need to take note of in these process of making a weldable or non-weldable edge on these material? Yeah, so when when we look at 
preparation. Travis mentioned a couple of different methods um, using a, a saw. A lot of times we can use a band saw. Uh, you know, there's a cold saw options and then plasma. The the actual pure cutting like a table saw, hand, you know, a circular saw or a cold saw with no cutting loop or or saw wax on that is going to produce the best option for us as far as being closest to ready to weld. And the reason for that is we're cutting and we're removing material, but we're not depositing material into the component. Um, a lot of uh, places in industry, if if it's you know places that are building tuna towers and 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 tops for like pontoon boats or pleasure boats, for example, they might be using a bandsaw. Um, what I have seen a lot in the industry is the places that are using a bandsaw because of the nature of the the saws themselves, a lot of times they're going to be using a saw wax. Um, and that's to help prevent the loading. They're taking smaller chips, things like that. And so that ends up collecting on the blade. And so they'll use a saw wax in order to help, you know, reduce the amount of contamination and, and make the blades last a little bit longer. Ultimately, what that can cause, though, is as that blade is on a bandsaw is cutting by the material, um, that wax that they would put on the, the blade is ultimately getting deposited or left behind in that rough hut edge. And so that is, again, something we'd have to go back in our preparation to what we've already talked about with the mechanical and chemical cleanings to help make sure we don't have any of that wax or hydrocarbon based material on it prior to welding. Um, another thing that we have to consider is, you know, water jets or plasma tables. So those are two, two unique animals. So water jet tables, a lot of places are moving to water jets because they can use it on, um, you know, all different materials, whether it be, be you know, for metal, plastics, uh, foams, what have you. And so water jets are becoming a little bit more popular in the industry. The problem with them, as you can imagine, is, as the name would imply, water. And what does water have in it? H2O, hydrogen. Hydrogen is, again, going back to that solubility and the, the uh, what we've talked about earlier, you're creating oxides or uh, the hydrated, you could be creating hydrated aluminum oxides on the surface um, in the surrounding area, but in on the actual edge where that material is being cut, water jets use an abrasive uh, like silica or sand in order to uh, help that stream of water cut through the material. That could be getting left, you know, deposited and left behind in that surface of the material, and that's obviously going to create issues for us. The last one that we want to cover is going to be like a laser or a plasma uh, uh, cutting process. A lot of people are probably using, if you're more of the homeowner um, or, or a smaller fab shop, if you're using handheld plasma, you know, those certainly work great, but we have to take special consideration on that uh, because of what is happening. And Travis, you want to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, some of the considerations that we have with using a plasma or a laser cut edge and, and what you see there. Yeah, and a lot of times, depending on what your plasma is, you'll see you know, a lot of dross on the backside of that weld. You won't have a perfectly clean cut a lot of times unless, you know, you spend a lot of time doing it. Lasers a lot of time are going to look a whole lot nicer and, you know, pick it up, look at it. Yeah, that's a nice weldable edge. But a lot of times what they can actually create is small microscopic cracking or micro cracking that you might, if you take it, butt it up, weld it, those cracks are still going to be under the surface and can actually start propagating from there. So a lot of codes are actually going to call, you know, whether it's laser or plasma cut, that there's going to be X amount of material that you're going to have to remove, you know, via another means like a carbide burr or a file, something like that, that's going to leave a weldable edge to get rid of those cracking issues. Um, so that comes back to some of the nature of aluminum that we'll talk a little bit about tonight. Uh, we'll talk probably more about that when we get Galen on filler metal selection um, coming up in future events on you know, what we see there for the material characteristics and cracking. We'll cover it here very, very briefly in the last, you know, 10, 15 minutes that we've got left here with you guys tonight. Uh, but that's something we'll definitely cover in some more detail coming up. But one thing that we want to make sure you just kind of keep in mind, like Andrew said, we want to think of all these different sawing, cutting materials that if they've got a tendency to load up your saw blade, that's going to tell you that more than likely it's overheating the piece on that very edge of the material. 
So more than likely, we need to do something different to clean that edge before we weld it. Um, and like I said, that might be done on the soft with a lubricant, but then we have to worry about on the welding side getting rid of that lubricant. Um, so a lot of different things to consider there. Again, you want to make sure this material is clean before you try to weld it to set yourself up for success. You know, whether that's from a quality perspective or a frustration perspective, if you're just getting started. Um, so that's something important to keep in mind. If we look at the next step, if we've got our material cut ready to go, we want to start looking at the edge prep in a weld joint type of geometry. Again, your filler metal base metal relationship is something that's extremely important. Your base material is going to point you in the direction of what kind of process do I need? What kind of filler material do I need? What kind of service is that going to be put in? Is it going to be high temperature? Is it going to be vibration, cracking, all that kind of stuff? We'll talk about that all in much more detail in future episodes coming up in the aluminum series. Um, but one thing we want to note is that it is very important um, to make sure that you have that correct fill of material before you start welding, that you know what your base material is. It's also going to affect uh, how that material welds, whether it's going to crack um, with, with or without fill of material potentially. Um, there's a lot of different again, aspects are coming into what we need to consider with that relationship that we'll talk a lot more coming in um, in future events. One thing that Andrew is going to cover here real briefly, and then we'll get back to a couple more questions that we've had throughout, um, is your different type of joint geometry, what that does to the different dilution ratios and things like that. But again, from the basic metal prep one thing that we want to stress is if you're going to get into a weld joint geometry, whether that's a butt weld, a lap, T, whatever that is, make sure you're cleaning all sides of that material that's going to be in the weld zone. Um, you know, so if you're looking at a T joint, it's going to be the surface on your bottom piece and it's going to be both sides and the end of your upper piece. And then don't forget about, you know, your short ends as well. Um, so make sure you're cleaning all of those materials. Andrew, you briefly want to cover what we've got up on the screen and a little bit of the joint geometry real fast here in a couple minutes. Yep. Um, and then we can get back to a couple more questions here before we let off for the night. Yeah, so as Travis mentioned, we want to be mindful of the base material and then also the filler material that we're using. Uh, if we think about aluminum and some of the characteristics, uh, aluminum, one of the things that we have to be extremely mindful of is cracking at solidification. And if we look at something like a 6061T6, it's a very common material. You know, the coupons that I have in front of me, you know, it's a 6061 base material. Uh, if we tried welding on that without filler material, or we tried to use, you know, just a straight butt joint, if we have a thick section and tried not to use very much filler metal, uh, what we can do is we can end up actually causing cracking uh, because we don't have the uh, correct alloying elements uh, to allow allow what you might say is that elasticity in the material as it solidifies. So as the material solidifies, it shrinks. And as it shrinks, uh, we need to make sure that it's like a stretchy rubber band rather than uh, like an old dry rubber band. And if it's like an old dry rubber band, what's going to happen when it gets pulled? It's going to break. And that's essentially what happens when you weld on a material. So a lot of times if we're trying to get adequate preparation or you know try to weld a joint, if it's a you know a section that's an eighth of an inch or thicker, one you have to have a lot of amperage to to penetrate through because of thermal conductivity and the heat sink of the surrounding material. You have to get you know put some sort of a bevel or a V in that in order to get one adequate penetration all the way through, but then also adequate dilution. And I think that's another good point for us is that the amount of heat that it would take to penetrate through a thick section of material with no joint prep ultimately puts you travel slower and you end up putting more heat into the surrounding material. And I think one of the big misconceptions with aluminum is the fact that, hey, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use this filler material and I'm going to weld it and it's going to make it strong, right? But what, what ends up happening is that our surrounding material, the heat affected zone, ultimately ends up being the weak point in the material. And, and so, the, the weld, if you try taking uh, aluminum in most cases, you make a weld and you try to you know, put it in a, some sort of a bend test um, or even in a tensile test, uh, what ends up happening is that material in the heat affected zone, so you know, a, uh, a quarter of an inch or so off of the toes of the weld, depending how, how thick the material is, 
that is going to be the weak point. And you can see on the chart that's on the screen here right now, um, shows that material strength at the distance from the weld. So, you know, right at the weld, we have nice, strong material. Uh, the, the actual weld itself is going to be nice and strong. As you move away from that weld, the strength is going to drop and then it's going to increase back up, uh, you know, as the, the further away that we get from that, that weld zone. And so making sure that we're being mindful of how we're prepping the part so we can get adequate penetration without having to, you know, sit on that with a lot of heat for a long period of time. Yes, our weld, um, you know, may, may, may take more passes, but we could, uh, in, in essence, be uh, preventing us from putting excess heat into the surrounding material. Yeah, and these couple of charts, they're of a book that's produced by Hobart. I think James will put the link to that into the chat. You know, that's going to be an excellent piece of reference material for anybody from the absolute beginner to somebody who's been in industry for years. They did an excellent job in that manual going through a lot of the issues that we're talking about and a lot of what we'll be covering in future episodes as well. Um, so that's a great reference for you guys to, you know, keep noted. Um, you can order hard copies of that, I think, as well. Uh, but that is a great kind of aluminum welding Bible type of thing. Um, they spent a lot of years pulling that book together. A couple of the questions that we've come in, I know that we've got that I have in front of me, and then James will have a couple more that we've covered. Um, some of the pieces to the puzzle here for these guys, but one of them that we had come in is how do you deal with welding old and new aluminum, even with a lot of cleaning and brushing, there's older stuff still giving them a lot of um, contamination versus the new. With that, a lot of the times it's going to be the nature of the beast. You know, if I take a transmission housing that's been living its life buried in grease versus a brand new aluminum coupon or cast in general, you know, versus a brand new coupon or extrusion, it's never going to weld that great. It's just that a lot of times that contamination is so deep into the material that you end up doing a weld it, clean it, grind it, weld it, clean it, grind it type of cycle until you really boil a lot of that material out. And a lot of times you might not even get it all out. Uh, it's just the nature of the cast. If it's some older cast, for sure, you got a lot of porous casts back in the day that were filled with sand and oil and all other kinds of contamination. Um, but again, if it's something that you can weld it and grind it and re-weld it without you know like andrew said a lot of times if you end up welding it too many times as well you're going to end up creating more heat in that material and potentially base material might weaken because of that so that one's kind of tough it depends on what your situation is if you've got something more specific you can email us that one um, but that's going to be a common thing like andrew had said too where you're losing that strength of the, around the weld where aluminum trailers you know there there's a life cycle there where they're going to start cracking and when they start cracking you're going to start chasing cracks forever because you get a crack you weld it and then you get another one that shows up right next to it so some of that stuff is pretty hard to catch up to it's just going to be nature of the beast but as far as the cleaning side things goes that hopefully will help again back to the older stuff if you get more of a question there feel free to email that into us and we'll try to help you out there um Another one that we got is I found it beneficial to pre-clean the aluminum oxide and then preheat to about 200 to remove moisture. I'm assuming that's two different pieces in one of actually brushing or chemically cleaning the aluminum oxide, then preheating it. Uh, depends on what it is. You know, some of the aluminum materials that you can be doing more damage than good there. Some of them, it might be required. It all depends on the application. One of the things that we've seen in the past of, uh, I would say, kind of an old school way of trying to prep aluminum or preheat it is, you know, or, or materials in general would be you get that black soot on there and then burn it off with the torch and, you know, consider that the preheat. A lot of issues can arise from that, especially on aluminum. Uh, you know, that black soot is all hydrocarbon. <laughs> so, you know, you immediately have to get rid of all of that before you weld it, or you've really just created yourself a headache. Um, so that's something that you want to be careful with, especially if you're in something that's a quality environment, you need to make sure you can or cannot be preheating based on what you're doing, what your alloy and what your weld procedure, all that kind of stuff is. Yeah. And, and, and Travis, I'd like to expand upon that. I know we're, we're running out of time here, but I'd like to expand on that one a little bit. 
uh, one of the things that we hear a lot is, you know, I need to, to take my oxy fuel torch and I need to, you know, sweat all of the, the moisture out of the material. And that's actually a big misconception that the moisture is in the base material. What is actually happening in that case, and it's, it kind of goes back to the material preparation of condensation as we go from one temperature to the next. When, when an oxy fuel torch is burning, it's actually creating um, water vapor um, in the, or, or a, a highly humid atmosphere in that, in that flame uh, from the chemical reaction of the, the oxygen and the acetylene you know, burning or propane, whatever it might be. And so what, what's actually happening is that highly humid hot air is hitting that cold you know, base material and it's actually condensating. It's not coming out of the material. Our flame itself is actually depositing it onto the surface of the material. And so one of the best ways to avoid that, if you need to do some sort of a preheat um, on a component, you know, if you have a nice, uh, you know, heavy shop table or something like that, where, you know, you don't have to worry about anything catching on fire, um, you know, preferably your weld table is one going to be one of the best options. Take one of those 500 watt, you know, halogen work lamps and place it, you know, pretty close to that component. I mean, those things get nice and warm. It's a nice dry heat. Let it soak for, you know, depending on the size of the part, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, if you got a big part. And that's going to give you a nice dry heat and help get the temperature of that component up without introducing hydrocarbons with some sort of a flame-based process. Oh, that's a great tip. James, any other ones that we've got coming in? I know we're running a little bit over on time, but hopefully everybody's still sticking with us here. Uh, any questions yeah, that we've got coming from the group discs tonight? made specifically for aluminum? Typically, those are going to probably be a little bit better option depending on whether they're an abrasive wheel or if they're like a, a diamond wheel um, on more of kind of a metal wheel. A lot of times you'll see those more and more now than what we have in the past. You know, those diamond wheels are going to be something that's much better than the typical standard abrasive wheel. Um, is that what you've seen as well, Andrew? Yeah, so generally the, those abrasive wheels, whether it's, you know, what you would say is for a steel-based you know, abrasive versus an aluminum based abrasive. Really one of the big differences is going to be the uh, material that it's made out of. And a lot of times if you use a, an abrasive wheel that's designed for steel and you use it on aluminum, what happens is it loads up and then, you know, you just get frustrated with it because it's no longer cutting. It's completely, you know, uh, galled or, or filled with that aluminum based material. And a lot of times with the aluminum specific abrasives, what they're actually doing is they have a, a, some sort of a lubricant in them, similar to what a lot of people would do on a saw. It's, it's essentially a, a, a hydrocarbon based material that is, as it gets hot, is creating a lubrication to prevent the aluminum from sticking to that, to that disc or that wheel. So again, going back to the concerns about depositing hydrocarbons on the surface of the material, great for post, you know, post weld cleanup. If you got to grind your welds off flush because that's the appearance that you want, something like that. Um, you know, those are going to work better. But it's in terms of preparation, we want to use more of a uh, non um, bonded cutting material, like you know, like a, a wire brush, uh, the, a carbide burr, uh, you know, a hand, you know, a very coarse hand file, something like that, where we're actually cutting the material and we don't have that chance of some sort of a lubricant or bonding agent getting deposited onto the material. Good question. Kind of to go off of what you just said, we did have a question asking what type of file should you use? Is there an issue with contamination when using a file since it is steel? So most of the files are, go are going to be an extremely you know, hard, material and in comparison with the aluminum you're not going you know it's going to be cutting and pulling that up off of the material um, certainly there's always anytime you have two metals or materials in contact with each other there's a, a certain level of risk but in the grand scheme of things with a file um, as long as you're dedicating it to one material so the the AWS D17 uh, specification which is for aerospace fusion welding they will actually specify that in companies you know that are doing that type of work your uh preparation materials whether it be files wire brushes carbide burrs any of the tools that you're using in your preparation process 
have to be dedicated and marked um, a certain material alloy, whether it be aluminum, nickel-based alloys, carbon-based alloys, titaniums, et cetera. And so, um, you know, that kind of goes into best practice within a, within a shop. If your stainless steel wire brush is for, for steel, keep it for steel. If it's for aluminum, keep it for aluminum. Don't go intermixing those. With the files, same thing. If it's, you know, if you're going to be using it for prepping carbon steel pipe, don't be bringing that over to aluminum. Uh, but the actual file itself um, causing contamination of the material, the risk is quite low. Yeah, and you need to keep that in mind too. Again, like Andrew said, any kind of chemical you try to put on that file to keep it from loading up, or if you're using a wire brush to clean that file out, make sure that that's going to be, you know, a stainless brush that's dedicated to cleaning that file, taking that dirty contaminated steel file uh, or steel brush onto the file, which is then going into your aluminum. So you're more at risk of a cross contamination there than you are just from the file itself. Anything else from the group, James? We just had one guy asking if Andrew could demonstrate the wire brushing process. Perfect. Yeah, like we had talked a little bit earlier, you know, and if you, once you get a little bit of heat, you know, if you tack your welds, you're going to see that brushing, you're going to feel it grab that brush a whole lot easier than when it's cold. But you want to show them a little bit what it looks like beforehand and kind of too much pressure or not enough pressure versus when it's actually starting to grab that brush and pull that oxide layer off. Yeah, so, so this surface here is actually a great surface. Um, we had it here mainly for for light because it wasn't super reflective with the lights in here um but this is really a hydrated aluminum oxide uh or the start of it on this material it had quite a bit of moisture sitting on it so this is going to actually be a great test so if we if we do this you can see here i have very little pressure and with that very little pressure we're not really getting any grabbing it's not creating any bristle marks because it's it's quite hard if we start actually putting some pressure on this You can see I'm starting to get a little bit of dust here. Um, you can see it on my hand. Uh, it's starting to actually clean that material, seeing it get a little bit more shiny. And if we continue with that, And that powder that Andrew just showed you on his fingers is a great example of why we need to come back and wipe over this chemically when we're done, because all that would just be boiling into your weld if you don't remove it one way or the other. Yeah, and so you can see here, I mean, there's a couple small spots that we could continue going on where there's like a recessed pocket um, if you wanted to get, um, you know, really, really particular about it. But that kind of gives you an example, just, you know, five or 10 strokes with the brush at, uh, you know, a pressure where you can start feeling it grab. If you really push on it, you're going to certainly feel it's going to really grab and dig in. And that's the point where we know we're probably getting, you know, past those aluminum oxides. We've got to start being careful of smearing the material down in but just a, a very light pressure we don't get any um you know cutting of those oxides with our brush a medium pressure we start getting that cutting action you start seeing that that fine powder um this has actually got some of the whatever that blue dye or paint is on there the, the layout dye um, and so that's where we we can start to see it's cutting it off we're starting to get some shiny material there which would be uh you know a more suitable welding condition we had and again, just mindful that you're removing that from all sides of your weld zone, not just on one surface. We did have one more question. Go ahead, James. Is it okay to use a stainless steel wire wheel and a drill to keep the speed down? That's, if you're careful. <laughs> I was, was going to say, a lot of it has to do, you know, certainly with the pressure. Um, I'm not going to say that you can't get good results. Uh, it certainly wouldn't be my preferred method because you do have, you know, a, a little bit less control and a little bit less feel on how much pressure you're actually applying uh, in that process. And I can tell you, I know, uh, depending on how you are as an operator, but I know I've ruined a lot of flap wheels long before they're uh, ever ready to be done based on overpressurizing them and, you know, trying to force the tool more than it's actually working. And that's something that you got to be extremely careful with on those brushes. You know, whether it's on a drill, on an angle grinder, any kind of powered stainless brush, the stainless brush is going to be effective as long as you're not cross-contaminating it, 
like Andrew said, the biggest thing is you put too much pressure on it or sit there for too long and warm that material up too much. You're going to start, you know, smearing that surface. If you think about it, it'll look like peanut butter on your toast where you're truly just start smearing that contamination around um, down into the surface of the material versus it brushing off like you saw in Andrew's fingers right there. So can it be done? Yes. Do you need to be careful with it? Absolutely. Anything else from the group tonight, Andrew, uh, James? I think we're good. Excellent. Well, we appreciate everybody hanging. Uh, I know we went a little bit over on time tonight, but hopefully you guys got some good information tonight. Again, if you've got questions that we didn't answer tonight, feel free to sh shoot those into the shop talk live at millerwilds.com. Um, if you've got future episodes that you'd like to see or topics that you'd like to see us cover, we're going to be doing some basic MIG, basic TIG, some advanced MIG, advanced TIG. Those are all on the docket coming up. Um, again, we'll be talking to Hobart with filler metal selection and joint, more of the metallurgy type of thing. We'll be covering that as well. So if you've got specific problems, questions, comments, concerns, feel free to email those in to us. Again, James, I think, put the link in there for you guys for that aluminum welding guide. That is going to be a great reference across the board. We'll be referencing that multiple times throughout the presentations. Uh, so take note of that. And again, please send in any ideas, questions, comments, concerns you have for us so that way we can make these seminars as beneficial for you uh, and what you truly want to see versus what we think you want to see. We get a lot of these questions day in and day out, and that's why I wanted to start this seminar um, series and really cover a lot of the issues, problems that we've seen throughout the years that keep coming up over and over again. So feel free to connect with us uh, we appreciate your time again andrew appreciate your time tonight so for everybody that was online james pulling this together for us we thank you um join us on the next one it's going to be a basic mig welding seminar that's going to be uh 223 7 central as well um so we'll hope to see you then so for tonight take care and we appreciate your time tonight and hopefully we'll see you again have a good night